<laughs> We're at that point that we referenced yesterday. Yeah. Yep. Good. Yeah. Done. <laughs> Hold off on that. Um, this one goes here, flush, like that. Perfect. Okay, so you can guide him into doing that. is this is not sustainable. Instinctively, they, 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 they go there, but then when the tide goes out, they get burnt by the sun and they end up dying. By creating these structures that have space and water retention, this is one of the ways you know, once again, In cities, when everything that allows people to kind of live and to function the name for it is known as infrastructure, so bridges, um, bus stops, all the, all the built things that allow people to exist in cities is known as infrastructure. So nature structure is a play on that term. So this is about how we build the infrastructure for animals. So how can we build for animals to live in, in, in cities like this? In the title of the show, I say this, like, you know, the history of cities, and this is true, this, is, this sounds a little kind of aggressive language, but it is true. If you really think about the history of us building cities, it's kind of about battling nature. Like, we, we, we create these barricades against the sea, mm -hmm. we build tall buildings, and we don't think about how they might impact birds that fly by. For example, this is Sydney, Australia. So this is called the Sydney Opera House. It's a, it's a very famous building. Now, when they built this, they created this waterfront and they installed all these flat metal panels that go down into the water. But flat metal panels, nothing can live on. You know, and the, the, the harbor, the natural harbor, as, as you can see, anytime you go to the sea or something, there's rocks and there's seas, there's, there's plants, and there's all sorts of little nooks and crannies and things for animals to live in, for fish and everything. But when you install something like this, what happened was it really, really damaged the fish and nature population. But they didn't realize this until after the fact. So these people, a group called Reef Design Lab, came along and they designed these units. The technical name is Habitat Panels. It's like a condo where fish go in mm -hmm. um, to protect for people um, from animals to eat them. And Clara, Clara, yes? yes. Yep. Yeah, okay. You are very, that was a very, very insightful answer because th this is about two things. It's allowing them to lay eggs because fish like laying eggs in little, you know, compartments, etc. But it is also about escaping from things that might want to eat them. What it does is it creates an environment where fish, there's a fish and these are, these are you know, sponges and oysters and everything. So this, this creates an environment where they're incredibly efficient cleaners. They clean the right. water. Right. And so without all this species, and that was, one, that was how they realized yeah. that they were in real trouble because right. Very quickly, over a few years, the mm -hmm. harbor just became polluted and became very, very dirty. Okay. Because once you strip out all this, this is everything that keeps the right. water system in balance. This is in the Netherlands. This is a bat water bridge. So bats pollinate a huge number of plants, they eat a tremendous amount of mosquitoes, 
And in areas where farming takes place, like maybe in New Hampshire, Vermont, and Western Massachusetts, where there's a lot of farms, bats remove a lot of the main agricultural pests. Mm -hmm. So bats are, are immensely, immensely important. We don't hear about bats that much, we don't see bats, and some people get a little bit freaked out about bats, but that's one of the reasons why they need a little bit more protection, because actually they are so incredibly instrumental in our food and also in preventing us from being completely overrun by insects. When they realized where they needed to build a bridge, they also discovered that it was in a main flight path of, of a migration route for bats. So when bats kind of go you know, to, to um, reproduce or when bats go uh, to where they were born, every year they go back and forth and they realized that right along this water was a main bat path. Now, we don't hear about it a lot, but bats are dying just as fast as all the bees that we, we hear about. They did a lot of research and they found that, that bats like these long, narrow spaces, so bats can come and they can create homes there, and known as roosts. So they come and they can create homes there, and then during the winter, on the back side of the bridge, there's a huge chamber where bats can go to hibernate for the whole winter. So they can just sleep you know, the whole winter through in this chamber and then in the spring come out again. So this is really fascinating in that it is created for two species at the same time, for people and bats. And both considerations went in at the exact same time to, to take care of both, both populations. And I think that that's a really nice model for the way we need to think sort of going forward. This whole section is about plants and what plants can do. And the reason that it's here is if you look out the channel right here, and you see how the, the city goes right up to the, to the water itself. The water ends and the city begins, and it's right there. Well, when Boston was first settled, and when every city was first settled, there would have been a huge number of plants and rocks and what, what we call wetland between here and the water. And that prevented, um, that, that prevented a lot of pollution from going into the water, and that also allowed the air and the water itself to be a lot cleaner. But as cities have built right up to the edge, there's no more plants, and there's no room for plants to be there. So these people have invented this, which is, in real life, it's, that, it's as big as that, and this is just a model of it. And what this does is it is a floating island to allow plants to grow at the edge of urban water systems. When the plants grow, their roots continue to grow into the water and they get nutrients from the water. So these are a little bit like floating water cleaners. And, and so this improves the quality of water a lot in, around cities. Rub your hand along the, the top of this and just feel. You feel how it's, it's you know, now it's kind of oily and greasy? Does this remind you of like sticking your hand in a bag of potato chips and after you've eaten a bunch of potato chips? Because that's exactly what this is. These are potato chips. Let me explain. In the sea, when tides come in, like during hurricanes, they can strip out. You can see here, at one moment this was all seagrass, but a hurricane came through and stripped everything from, from the water. What happens is nothing can grow back because it, it has no foundation. This is the foundation. This is called beast elements. They take one of these and they secure it to the ocean and they put a few pieces of seagrass into it. And this is the beginning. And then a few months later, the tide comes in and it creates a foundation. So the seagrass can, can take root. So it can begin to grow, just like in a garden. It can begin to grow. And this is a nice photo because it shows that once it begins to grow, so you see this is the very beginning, and then it grows like this, and over the next few years it's just going to keep growing, so then all the kelp and the seagrass and the seaweed and everything grows, and you see what's happening to it over here? It's just disappearing, it's just dissolving, because it's just, it's natural, it's just potato starch. It provides a fairly good nutrient bed for a lot of these species. So, in two years, this just completely disappears, and what's left 
is the regrown seagrass and the regrown natural wildlife that, that exists there.